Would you join me in the Word? Would you uh, pull out your Bibles with me and let's go to the book of Galatians uh, toward the end of your New Testament. We're going to pick up there where we left off last week. We're going to continue on in our series that we started on Easter Sunday. We're calling this Unlocking Freedom. And we're going verse by verse through Galatians. Now, we're going to cover a lot of ground this morning. Um, we're going to go all the way through chapter 2. We're going to cover a whole chapter this morning. And as we do that, let's kind of understand where we've come from over the past couple of weeks. This letter that Paul has written uh, to the churches in Galatia, these are, th this is a letter that he's written back to churches that he planted. These are churches that he started all throughout Galatia. And these are Gentile churches. Now, Paul was, uh, of course, a Jew. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He uh, told us in the first chapter uh, and in other places in the Bible that he was an up-and-comer. He was one of the leaders uh, among the Jews. He was a persecutor uh, of the Christian faith. He was one of those guys that approved of and often led uh, to the persecution of the, of the, New, Ch of the New Testament church uh, of believers. He, would, uh, he was the guy who approved of Stephen's stoning. He would go from place to place, and he would have Christians drug out of their homes. He would have them beaten. He would have them imprisoned, and sometimes they were martyred or killed for their faith. And so Paul was an up-and-comer in, in the practice of the law, of the Old Testament law. He believed that he was doing right by God by doing this and by going against this one who claimed to be the Son of God against Jesus. But... Paul was, uh, Saul was radically changed. Um, and when a person's life is changed by God, it is radically changed. Amen? And so that's what happened to Saul. Saul. In fact, Saul was on his way to Damascus, to a place called Damascus, to persecute more Christians. He was going there to drag them out of their houses and have them beaten and flogged and whatnot, some of them imprisoned. And when he was on his way to Damascus, the Scripture tells us that he was, uh, that he was miraculously blinded that he, uh, it was a radical change. I mean, it was God's time for him to be a different person, to be born again, to be saved. And so that's what happened to him. Now, so as we get into Galatians, two weeks ago on Easter, and then in last week, we covered chapter 1. So if you've got your Bibles, just kind of glance back at chapter 1 before we get to where we're going today. So we see in Galatians uh, chapter 1 that Paul is defending the gospel. Here's what had happened. Paul had planted these churches in Galatia, these Gentile churches. Gentiles are, uh, are people that were not of Jewish descent, and they had come to Christ. Because Christ, remember the Old Testament, the God's chosen people are Israel, it's the Jewish people, but we realize that Jesus Christ came to be the final sacrifice and made salvation available for the you's and me's, right? He, he made it available for, for people to come to know Christ outside of the Jewish nation. And so... We see that, and in chapter 1, here's what's happening. Paul's planted these Gentile churches. He has gone and shared the gospel and said, you can be changed, you can be saved, and people come to Christ. But now, these Jewish believers from Jerusalem are coming in behind him in Galatia, and they're telling them, hey, Paul's got it wrong. Paul, yeah, we, we believe Jesus. We, these, these Jewish converts, we believe in Jesus. We believe that he died on a cross. We believe he rose again. We, we believe he's the son of God. But we don't need to discount all the works and other stuff that we need to add to it. You all remember that? We talked about it last week that, that they were coming in and saying, well, yeah, that's good, but we need more than Jesus. We need to keep the law. You're going to have to do all these rituals. You're going to have to do all this other stuff to make your salvation count. In other words, it's a work salvation. So Paul said that by grace through faith, Jesus is enough. Jesus is, Jesus is the final sacrifice. Jesus is enough. And that's what we believe is the New Testament church. But these folks were coming in and, and distorting the gospel. So if you glance back through chapter 1 of Galatians and start to look at where we've been the last couple of weeks, you see some verses like verses 6 and 7 where Paul is very clear. He said, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him, being Jesus, who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. I'm, I'm, I'm astonished that you're listening to these people. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and they want to distort, distort the gospel of Christ. And it's a reminder to us as the church in, in our day that it, all, around in our world and our society, there are all kinds of people that are going to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are people going to make it say what they want it to say, try to act like God didn't say what he said. And at some point, we either believe what the Bible says or we don't. We, we live by it or we don't. 
And Paul was saying, this is the gospel. Or you look at verses, uh, you look at a verse like verse 10 in chapter 1 that says, Am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see, our job as the church is not to make people happy. Our job as the church is not to serve society and to serve ourselves and to, you know, to be inward looking and, and think about ourselves. Our, our job is to serve Christ. And, and to honor Christ. And so he said, that, that's what this is about. So why are you listening to these people? Look at what the gospel says. Look at what I taught you. I was inspired by God to write this, is, is what he had told us. And then we look at uh, verses 13 through 24. Basically, this is where we were last week. And Paul says, if that's not enough, he's telling the church at Galatia, then look at my life. Look at who I used to be. I was Saul of Tarsus. I used to hate people like you. I used to persecute people like you. But look at the change in my life. I was Saul, but now I'm a new Paul. I'm a, I'm a changed person. And I love how verse, uh, chapter 1 ended with verse 24. If you've got your Bibles there, he, he was saying, the people that I used to persecute, they look at my life now, and look at what verse 24, and they glorify God now because of me. And so last week, we kind of ended here. This is the question we asked everybody. I asked myself, I asked you as, as the church body. We asked ourselves, just like Paul was saying here, do people praise God because of who you are? When people look at your life, do they praise God because of who you are, who you've become, because you know Christ? And that's really the way we have to, to look at this. Now, we move on to chapter 2 this morning. We're going to cover a, a full chapter this morning. And for those of you, I know we've got some, some note takers in the congregation. Some people are like, I know the people that aren't writing. I know y'all are even smarter. I know you're taking mental notes, right? You just got it all right up here. But if you're taking notes, I think this is a great chapter to approach this way. Sometimes it helps me to kind of have an outline before I go into it. So let me just kind of, just real quick, if you're a note taker or a mental note taker, get this. Just a quick glance at chapter 2 and then we'll read it. The first 10 verses or so of this chapter we're seeing that Paul is telling them, he's kind of still reiterating here, and he's kind of pushing the, the, the Galatians to understand that there's validity in what he's saying. And he is telling them, look, in, in the first 10 verses, he's saying, I've been accepted by the apostles. In other words, Paul's saying, I'm not just some random dude. I was called by God, and I didn't just start preaching some crazy thing I didn't know about, but I've actually, been, I've actually gone back, and I've been approved by the apostles, and we'll see it in a second when we read it, but these were people like James and John and, uh, and a guy named Cephas. Anybody know who Cephas was? Peter. Cephas is Peter. It's Simon Peter. Okay? Jesus called Simon Peter. He called him Cephas because he was the rock on which the church was built. And so he's saying, look, I'm, you know, I've been approved by these people. Now, Paul wasn't a pushover, though, because if you look at verses 11 through 14, the second kind of part of the outline, you're going to notice that Paul had enough guts to even call some of these people out, especially Peter, Cephas, called them out for their hypocrisy. They kind of give him the, 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 the handshake of fellowship in the first ten verses, He's saying, you know, they, they befriended me. We teach the same gospel. But you're going to see in verses 11 through 14 that Paul said, hey, I'm still catching you sometimes kind of leaning toward the Jewish works system. And he called Cephas out on it. He called Peter out on it. So Paul wasn't afraid to do that. And then verses 15 through 21, we really get a good picture. So look at this as we read it in a second. We, in verses 15 through 21, we really get a good picture of how a person is justified before Christ. This is a real picture of salvation. It's, it's how a person is truly saved. Now, in our society, people are going to tell you all kinds of things about how to, be, how to be in right standing with God. I prayed a prayer when I was a young child. I go to church some. I'm a pretty good person. Surely God's okay with me. But salvation comes through Christ alone. We have to be justified before God through Christ. That's how a person is saved. And so that's what, that's what um, Paul's going to talk about here in the last part of Galatians. So let's read it together. Look at Galatians 2. A little bit lengthy, but let's read it together. This is God's Word. Galatians chapter 2. It says, After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. 
And I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. So Paul is just validating all this. I'm not throwing out some crazy gospel, like I said earlier. I went to the apostles, trying to make sure that, you know, that, that what I'm teaching is, is right on. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential... What they, were, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those I, though I say who seemed influential added nothing to me. Verse 7 says, On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, that's the Gentiles, just as Peter had been entrusted to the gospel of the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. Verse 9 says, And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, here it is, this is the fellowship, the, agree, the agreement, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they should go to the circumcised. Only they ask us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. Now we get to the second part of the outline. Verse 11 says, But when Cephas, that being Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. It's pretty funny. Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. In other words, he's saying, look, Cephas, Peter, you're teaching this, but when they actually came in the room, you're acting like you're embarrassed to be seen with them or you're, you know, you're not sure of all of this. And so verse 13 goes on, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with them so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you though a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? In verse 15, this is the last part of the outline, he says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified. Here it is. Here's the gospel. Here's salvation. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. Verse 17. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For though the law, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. And here it is, verse 20. Paul saying, this is what happened to me. This is salvation. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. In other words, he's saying, we're wasting our time. It's in vain. And it's the same for us today. If Christ didn't die for the remission of sin, if Christ didn't die so that people could be saved, if Christ wasn't enough, then we're wasting our time. We might as well leave and head to lunch right now. And we'll beat all the other churches there, right? I mean, we're wasting our time. What are we doing here if Christ is not enough? And I go back to verse 20, and, and that's where I want to key this morning. Look at verse 20. This is, I mean, one of the most incredible, I mean, the whole Bible is incredible, but this is one of the most incredible verses in all the Bible. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what Jesus did for us. So if this passage is about authentic, let's just key in on verse 20. Underline verse 20 in your Bible, and you might say, well, I don't write my Bible. That's fine. Just look at verse 20. Listen, if this passage is about authentic faith, then according to Paul, he said, and he said he got this straight from God. He's already told us this in, in this letter to the Galatians. Then an authentic, real Christian according to this verse, is a person who has died and has been reborn in Christ. But here's the problem, I believe, this morning. I look at this verse, and this is where I got hung up this week as I prepared for this morning. 
I don't think we fully comprehend, and I don't think that maybe sometimes we completely understand what it means to die to self because inherently we are all selfish people, aren't we? I mean, we really are. We, we're all selfish people. That's why we needed Christ. We have, a, we have a sinful nature and we needed God to redeem us. I had, I had one of those kind of things, a couple of things really kind of happened to me this week that made me think about that a little bit. Yesterday, my, my kids were playing in a tennis tournament and uh, two of the older kids were playing, and Jake had already played uh, one of his matches, and so he was in between tennis matches, and, he, and I was trying to watch the other kids, and he ran up to me, and he said, Dad, I need to, I need to go to the restroom. And we were at, the, uh, at one of the YMCAs uh, in Birmingham, and so kind of a big complex, and, and, and just in a moment of not thinking, I said, well, sure, run on the restroom and, and come straight back. And I wasn't thinking where I had sent him in. I'd sent him back into the YMCA. And it wasn't just like a men's restroom. It was a men's locker room, okay? And so Jake comes back, and he comes back and just in, in about five minutes from there, and he's, he's standing there like this. And he looked like, you know, something had happened, like, majorly. And I look at him, I said, you okay, buddy? And he said, I think I just had the most devastating experience of my young eight-year-old life. <laughs> and I look at him, and I said... And then it dawned on me, I sent him to a men's locker room. There's a bunch of old men in here that had just worked out. Anyway, he, he, said, he said, so I just walked through like this. I didn't look at anything, Dad. I didn't look at anything, Dad. And, uh, and he, he said, I'm never going to be the same again. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, oh, my goodness. I was like, I can't believe I just did that. And, I, and it made me, you know, and at that moment, I'm thinking, I'm preaching Galatians 2. We're on we're in verse 20, and Paul says, we're new. I said, that's a great sermon illustration. When we come to know Christ, listen, we die to our old selves. We are born again in Christ, and we are never the same again. Y'all are never going to forget that now, right? We're never the same again. And I don't think we really comprehend death. I don't think we, I don't think we comprehend being dead to our old selves really like we should because maybe sometimes we don't think enough about the fact that it was God himself who gave his life for us. In the Bible, I mean, John 1 was says, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and, and, and Jesus says that he's the Word. He was asked, who are you? And he said, he said I am. I am the great I am. And Jesus claimed the authority of God. And, and, and if we believe what the Bible says, we believe that God is, is, is fully God. He's a triune God. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This past week, I was uh, in my garage, and I was putting together... Um, my same Jake had saved up his money and he bought one of those, you remember those green machine uh, three wheel, uh, little big wheels things? It's like the ones for the bigger kids or whatever. He saved up his money and bought one of those. I was like, that's great. And then I realized it was going to take me like six hours to put it together. And so I'm putting it together in the garage. And of course, I'm right in the middle of doing it. And I see a car driving the driveway. I see a man get out and he's walking toward me with a pamphlet and the Jehovah's Witnesses were there. I was like, okay, great. And I said, like, dude, you want to put this thing together? I said, I'd be glad to talk to you for a while if you put it together for me. He didn't. And I, and I always, when those kind of things happen to me, I pray, I realize it's very hard with someone who is really convinced of what they believe to ever really um, balance being a good witness to them and balance that out with the fact that you're put on the spot and you have to defend the faith. You see what I'm saying? And it's a hard thing to do. And, and I, won't, I won't get into the whole story, but he proceeded to, to tell me, and I tr was just listening for a second, and I, before I told him that I was a Christian and a pastor and that what he was saying wasn't going to convince me, but he, he proceeded to tell me that, uh, that Jesus is not fully God, uh, that Jesus just came along, that he was no different than, than Adam. He just succeeded and was able to do what Adam couldn't and what Adam failed at, at doing. And uh, I said, you're wrong. Uh, you, you got that all messed up. And, and, he, and, he, and so then he told me, I'm getting to the point here, he, he told me that I needed to read my Bible. And I said, well, actually, you need to read my Bible. <laughs> Um, I said, why don't you read my Bible instead of reading the stuff you've got because what you've got has been changed and then it all kind of went downhill from there and Sharon happened to pop in the garage and then she closed the door and went back in. She was like, oh no, and because uh, she heard me, you know. And so 30 minutes later, I still hadn't gotten any more done on the green machine but, and, then, and then he finally left and that's a whole different story. But, um, 
but it was just a, it was a reminder that at some point, someone, and, and this guy told me that he had grown up in the church, but he had been deceived. He had listened to a gospel that was false and something that someone convinced him of. And I don't know about you, you could hear a million different things, but if I'm going to bank my life on anything, I'm going to bank it on what God says and not what somebody else says. And that's the point of it. Paul says that this kind of gospel, this kind of, that what Jesus says causes a person to die to, them, to their old self and become reborn in Christ. You're a different person. And we throw around that word dead in our, in our English vocabulary and I don't think we really comprehend what Paul is saying when he, when he says, it is no longer I who live. I'm dead to myself, but it's Christ who lives in me. I mean, think about the way we use the word dead. I mean, there are dead dogs. There are dead ends. When you come in last, you're dead last. If you're wrong, um, you know, Sharon's working in the nursery this morning, so maybe she can't hear me. Um, but when you're wrong around my place, you're dead wrong, you know. Um, if you're scared, you get scared half to death. Uh, earlier this month, we... You know, we encountered one of those uh, unchangeable features of life. Uh, hopefully not the first one, but those two features are death, right, and taxes. And if you get on the wrong side of your husband or wife, you're a dead duck. Um, I play a lot of tennis and, if, and give some lessons, and if I've got a dead tennis ball in my hopper, then the fun thing to do is to knock it down in the woods because it's not any good anymore. It's deader than a doornail. A sports event might, if it's tied, it might end in sudden death. I mean, we throw the word death. If you, if you shoot a gun, then you're going to take dead aim. If you hit the bullseye, you were dead on. Uh, the coldest time of the year is what? The dead of winter, right? The hottest time is what? The dead of summer. Bad, uh, you know, bad April Fool's joke. Uh, you, know, you, were, you know, you were a dead giveaway when you didn't do it well. If, you're, if, you, uh, if you don't have a chance, you're dead in the water. If you're embarrassed, you could have died a thousand deaths because you were so embarrassed. When somebody's sound asleep, they're dead to the world. And some people wouldn't be caught dead doing this or doing that or being seen around them or being in that place, right? I mean, we throw around that word dead like, you know, it has no meaning. But the way Paul used it here, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I'm dead to my old self and I'm alive in Christ. I'm different than I used to be. I read a quote uh, this week that says, Many people determine that the meaning of life is to be found in material things, so they set themselves out to acquire them. Other people determine that the meaning of life is to be found in pleasure, so they set out to indulge themselves. Still others determine that the meaning of life is to be found in a career or money or social standing. They become workaholics, they become greedy, they become class conscious. And the thing that all these have in common is a relentless and a desperate and even frantic pursuit of those things. And the sad reality of it all is that even when they attain a measure of these things, they find that they are still unfulfilled. And that's what happens when people don't become dead to self and they don't die to themselves and become alive in Christ. They keep searching for hope. And you've heard me say it a million times. We are all designed with a God-shaped hole in our lives that can never be filled and, and, and bring eternal joy unless it is filled with Jesus Christ. And so Paul, that's what Paul is saying here and you take it a step further and you talk to people that already know christ in this room there's a lot of people sitting in here this morning and you already know christ we, we we've come to faith in christ we have life because of jesus and, and we know that we know that the meaning of life centers around jesus but how do we really live like paul is talking about this morning how do we get to that point where we have this realization deep in our souls and maybe just think about it for a minute we've been here but and we realize we're saved by christ i mean that's that, that's a reality in our lives. We know that. But we don't merely just want to exist in the remaining days we have here on this earth. We want to be alive in Christ. We want to really know how to live as Christians. And Paul is talking about that as well. How do we really live? How do we really understand what he's talking about when he says that I've been crucified with Christ? What did Paul mean by that? Well, Paul didn't mean that he himself actually hung on a cross with Jesus, like Jesus did, Paul meant that, or, or that, that his death, that he died, meant what Jesus did. That's not what he's saying. But he grasped the fact that Jesus took his place, that, that when, when the, blood of, that the blood of Christ covered his sin, and that's the same for you and I. 
If you're a Christian this morning, the blood of Christ stands in the way of your sin. And, and it's an awesome thing to think about. And the more that Paul, I believe, thought about that, and we should model Paul in this, the more he thought about that, the more thankful he was. The more it drove his life as a believer, the more he lived that out, the more, th the more he was thankful. The more he lived his life abandoned to Christ, the more he used everything he did to be a, a platform in which to share the gospel and live out the gospel. And across this room, God has given us so many opportunities. God's putting people in all kinds of different places, in workplaces and in your family, in the communities, in the schools, and wherever God is putting you. And we're all, if we are, every believer in this room, we're all ministers of the gospel. And I think the modern day church has messed that up in so many ways. We view church as like something we come to sometimes and we hear some guy, you know, preach a sermon and sometimes it might be pretty good and sometimes it's not his best week and this or that and we sing a few songs and some weeks the band's awesome and sometimes they're not as awesome and then sometimes we go to class and that man that bible study lesson was good this morning i didn't get as much out of that one this week or this or that and we've made church into that but the church is the body of christ and god sends us out as ministers everywhere every day to, to make a difference for his kingdom and give us that platform. So it goes back to that first question that we asked this morning. When people look at your life, like Paul said at the end of chapter 1, are they glorifying God because of you and who you are and what you're doing and the way you're living your life? You see, Paul understood this. And he was saying that Christ died for me. I've understood that and I've come to Christ and it's, and, and it's what drives me. I'm thankful for it and it's, what, it's what's changed me. So... Here again, here's a note-taking part. What, did, what does Paul mean here when he says, I've been crucified with Christ? What are some basic understandings, some things we should walk away understanding this morning? Well, here's the first one. When we talk about being crucified with Christ, understand this, that in God's eyes, number one, with Jesus' death, the penalty of the law was satisfied. There wasn't, there's, there's no other sacrifice that needs to be made. There's no other sacrifice that could be made that could surpass that one. So it, it all came down to Christ. In God's eyes, with Jesus' death, the penalty of the law was satisfied. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, it says in Romans. Paul understood that the guilt of his sin had been washed away through Christ. Jesus' death meant that Paul didn't have to die for his sin he didn't have to do that because Jesus did it. Verse 19, if you go right back, right before our key verse today, look at what he said in verse 19. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. The, the penalty of the law was satisfied so that I might live to God. I was crucified with Christ. Therefore the law has been satisfied. Jesus took my place. He died my death because he loves me. The second thing that I think Paul was saying here is, when he says that he was crucified with Christ, he's understanding, and get this, only a true believer knows this. He's saying that when a person is crucified with Christ, when we come to know Christ, that it brings a joy, a, a, an, an eternal, deep inner joy that can never be stolen or taken away from you. That's something that a believer has that a non-believer doesn't have. If you're in here this morning and you're a believer, you know that, you understand it. You may not feel it sometimes, but it's the truth. And truth and feelings are two different things. But if you're not a believer, you don't have that joy. You don't have that eternal joy that come what may, you still have Christ. So Paul's experienced this freedom and liberty through Christ. He's experienced a joy that allows him to rejoice in all things. Even when things get difficult and hard and life falls apart and you don't know why what's happened to you is happening and work's not good or family's not good or, or you know, relationships are not good and, and, or, or you're struggling in this sin or this or that or whatever it may be, life is all falling apart and you may not feel too Christian, you, if you know Christ, your joy in Christ can never be taken away. It, it, it just can't. You may not feel it, but, but you are eternally... In Christ, if Christ is the one who saves you, how can you or a person take it away from you? That just, that just dumbs God down. I mean, if God saves, how can we take away stuff that God gives? So what I guess I'm saying is come hell or high water, if we know our maker in heaven, we can hang on and we can trust and know that God is in control.
And he doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. It's a, it's a characteristic of God that will never change. And a non-Christian doesn't have that. The third thing is this. Paul, by saying he's crucified with Christ, he means that his old worldly self is, is, is changed. He's become a new creation in Christ. But he's also understanding, you've got to understand this, if you read Paul's, uh, even other places in the, in the Scripture where Paul talked, if Romans 7, just jot down Romans 7, go read it this week. Romans 7 is a great example. Paul understood, yes, I've been crucified in Christ, I'm not who I used to be, but he also understood that he still had a sin nature. Okay? How many of you in here, since you've become a Christian, have been perfect? Like one guy accidentally slipped up his hand, but he wasn't listening to my question, right? We still have a sin nature. We still fall short. I mean, we still make mistakes. So the Christian life after you become a Christian is a growth process. It is, it is longing to be more like Christ. And when you fall short, the, the, a true sign that you're a believer is that you hate that and you don't want to go back down those dead end roads and you want to change and you want to become more like Christ. So Paul understands that. He's saying salvation is kind of like the gift that keeps on giving. Yes, I'm crucified in Christ. Yes, I was redeemed. There was a point in which I was justified. For him, it was on the road to Damascus. But I don't quit living that out day by day. I die to myself every day and come alive to Christ. I trust in Christ. I walk with Christ. It's, 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 in some respects, it's a one-and-done deal, but in other respects, it's not. In, in other words, you, you can't just... Say, well, I, I pray some prayer and make some decision and then your life never changed and, and, and expect that that was real. I make some prayer, I, make, I pray some prayer, I make a decision and what's proof that it's really real is that I live it out and there's a growth process and I'm becoming more and more like Christ and I fail sometimes and I hate it and I want to be more and more like Christ. It is that growth process. It kind of reminds me of the, the, the movie Christmas Vacation. Not endorsing it, but some pretty funny stuff in that and... and Cousin Eddie is over at Clark's house, and Clark was expecting a big Christmas bonus for, for Christmas, and he had already gone and purchased a pool for his house. He'd already spent his Christmas bonus before he got it. So he was expecting a $10,000 Christmas bonus like he got every year. Well, this year the boss decided to make some cutbacks, and he cut out all the Christmas bonuses. And so the, the, on Christmas Eve, the mail delivery man shows up at the house, and Clark still didn't know it yet, and he, and he opens up the mail, and he's standing in front of the whole family, and he's opened up. He thinks it's going to be the $10,000 check, and he opens it up, and you can see him start to shake, and his face is getting red, and he opens it up, and it was a, it was a certificate to the, to the, it was a year subscription to the Jelly of the Month Club. And Cousin Eddie is standing there, and he said, well, at least it's the gift that keeps on giving, Clark, you know. And that's the point, is that Paul is saying, look, this is a gift that keeps on giving. We are born again in Christ. We, are, we're, we were lost, we're, but we are saved in Christ. And it never runs out. It never stops giving. This is an eternal thing. Joy can't be stolen, can't be taken away from you. You, you know Christ. And he was driving this home with the Galatians because these people were trying to tell them, no, Jesus wasn't good enough. You're going to have to do all these works. You're going to have to perform all these rituals to keep in good tune with God. You're going to have to do this. Paul was saying, no, that's not the way it is at all. You know, your worthiness comes through Christ. It'll never be through stuff that you can try to prove yourself out to God by doing. And so Paul was telling them that. And so Paul is saying, look, for me to die to, Christ, die to myself and to come alive to Christ is a very important thing. You might just jot down some verses here. Philippians 1.21 says, for me, Paul told the church at Philippi, he said, for me to live is... Christ. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, he told the church at Colossae, he said, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. He said, it's in Christ that I've been made complete, Colossians 2, 9 and 10. In Philippians, Paul was writing to the church at Philippi. He, was, he, he told all these churches over and over. He said, I want to know Christ, and I, know, I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection of the dead. Again, he told the church at Colossae in Colossians 3.3, 3, he said, for you died, and your life is now hidden in Christ, in God. That's, that's the word to believers. We died, and our lives are now hidden in Christ, in God. Colossians 2.20, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why? And this is kind of a calling to the church and a reminder he said then, he was telling the church at Colossae, then why, as though you still belong to it, 
He was saying, you don't belong to it anymore. Why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Paul writes, I die every day. That's what we were just talking about. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day and come alive to Christ. John 12, 24. This was Jesus. In John 12, 24. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. You, you can't be a Christian if you haven't died to yourself and come alive in Christ. And so, I want to kind of end it with this. Understanding being dead to ourselves and then becoming alive in Christ, it, it means that if you're a Christian, then here's really what we ought to be experiencing. If you're, if you're a believer this morning, this is, this is where our lives ought to be. Number one, the authentic, real Christian has a true desire deep in his or her heart to be dead to the old self. If you don't have that desire, if, you're not, if, if, if you only want what you want and your life is about you and you don't care anything about what God thinks or what God says and you don't have a desire or a hatred toward sin and you don't want to be more and more like Christ, Look, God's your judge, but I would venture to say that you're not truly converted. You've not died to yourself and you've not come alive in Christ. I would venture to say you're not truly a Christian. You may be a church attender, but you don't know Christ. The authentic Christian has a true desire to be dead to the old self. Jesus said, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Are you a follower of Christ? That verse is found in, all, in, in three of the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Do you have a daily desire to be like Christ? The second thing is the authentic Christian not only wants to be dead to the old self, but he wants to be dead to sin. I kind of hit on that with the first one. Got ahead of myself, but he wants to be dead to the sin. Not only his old self and the desires, but he wants to be dead to sin. And, and, and God can help you grow in that. God can help you grow in that. And the third thing is this. Christians want to be dead to desires. Now, look, all you got to do is, you know, go to the store. You know, go, go live life out in society in a day, and there's all kind of temptations. Desires come your way. Things hit us out of the blue sometimes. But how do we deal with those? But you have a true desire in your heart. We're not dead to all desire, but we want our desires to change. We want to desire the Word of Christ, and we want to desire deep fellowship and walking with Christ. But unless we're willing to die to self and die to sin, die to desires, then we're not understanding the gospel. So I go back to that first question that we ended in chapter 1 with. I kind of just close out the whole thing with us understanding that. When, someone, when other people look at your life, when you look at your life, and most importantly, when Christ looks at your life, is it glorifying him? Do they see a changed person? Do they see someone who died to sin and self and came alive in Christ, someone who was born again. If our band wants to come back up, we're going to sing one more song before we go this morning. And uh, I just want to invite you this morning, if you are not alive in Christ, if you're not sure that you're saved, if you don't know, um, if you have a relationship with Christ, would you please come and talk to one of us and just let us share with you how to be born again. But maybe you're a lot of believers in this room. You know, and so are you, are you living alive in Christ? Are you understanding that fully? Is, it, is there sin standing in the way? Um, is apathy there? Are you, are, have you become lazy in your Christian walk? Whatever it may be, um, put that before the Lord. Uh, listen to the verse uh, one more time. Listen to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Pretty strong scripture, and that's what, that's what Paul says. We have to die to self and come alive in Christ. Let's stand this morning and let's sing. If you'd like to come and pray, I'd invite you to come and do that as well, okay?